we're going to focus in on the workload manager here today because it will give you uh, the biggest bang for your buck. And it, it, it's the key tool within Amazon Redshift to help you get high concurrency. So this is uh, a screenshot of your Redshift, of your, uh, Redshift console. And there is a tab in there, which is the workload management configuration. And this is sort of like the default setting. In the default setting, um, you see a Q down here. This is Q number one. Um, actually, there are two Qs. There's a reserved super user Q. Um, you can't configure this Q. It does not appear in the Redshift console. It's there for the use super user. When something goes wrong, it allows you to run one query. And so uh, that way, you can at least do something when your cluster basically has hit the wall. And then there's the default user queue to run queries. The default configuration for the queue is five. You can see this here, right? So you have one queue with a concurrency of five. That means at any given point of time, um, you can run five concurrent queries. Now, Redshift allows you to add more queues, right? You can see this here, this button here, blue button, add queue. So those are the user-defined queues. You can add more queues. Um, and the key concept here behind it is to separate certain queries from each other. And this is a concept we're going to go into um, during this webinar. Um, I also wanted to point out a feature called short query acceleration. Uh, at the end of this, I'm going to share a link to a blog post I wrote about this. Um, it's, uh, we, it, it is useful, but you know, you, when you, you should know what you're doing with it when you sign up for it. I, I would discourage you from just hitting this little checkbox here that says, enable short query acceleration because it comes at a cost and a trade-off. All right, so with that on uh, the Redshift Workload Manager, let me give you some background here, right? So the, um, there's a 99% chance the default single queue will not work for you. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, your workloads are unique. They're, uh, they're, they're not one size fits all, right? They're very specific to your company. Maybe you have certain data loads that trigger at a certain time of the day. Uh, a, a frequent pattern is that everybody comes into the office on Monday morning and refreshes their dashboards, and so everything slows down. And this is because, um, let's see if we have here. And that's because, uh, oops, sorry, go back. And this is because Redshift is greedy, right? So a query that runs will try to get all the available resources it can get. And there are these two types of resources. There's concurrency slots, and then there's the available memory. So if you have one big query, it's going to consume a hell of a lot of resources. And uh, you know, it might consume that away from others. So the goal of WM is really to protect your key workloads, your key queries from each other. Um, we'll go into uh, to detail what those are, and also make sure you have maximized you, you maximize your query throughput. So the key is that every query that runs at runtime has a slot and doesn't wait, right? And then they also need sufficient memory to run. If they do not have sufficient memory to run, they will fall back to disk. Uh, that will make them slow in the first place. But what it also does it increases the use of I/O, which means the entire cluster will slow down. And so this is why using the WLM will give you the biggest bang for the buck to get high throughput of task queries. So let's go through uh, three types of queries here, and let's use them as an example. We have loads. These are jobs that load data in. We have transforms. These are transformations that you run once your data is in the cluster. Uh, this is more like from ETL to ELT. You're actually doing ELT. You're extracting, you're loading, and then you're transforming. And then you have ad hoc. You know, once these transformations are available or data is available in the cluster, your analysts can query it. So these are the type of three, three types of queries. And I've put numbers in here. This load runs five seconds. Um, this is a transform. You know, it's pretty complex. It runs 60 seconds. And this is an ad hoc query that may run 20 seconds. So just take this as an example. OK, so let's look at our default queue. So let's say this is the five slot mark. And you know, at any given point of time, I've, uh, I've created an ETL pipeline that runs two jobs at a time. Each one takes five seconds, and they execute. And you can see here, basically, nothing. I have five slots. Only, only two queries are running at any point of time. So you know, it's fine. The world is fine. Uh, each query gets a slot. My loads are running just fine. Now, let's add the scheduled jobs and ad hoc queries. 
And maybe there's a certain time of the day, right? Maybe they get scheduled at a certain time over and over again. So what I've done here, this, this hypothetical picture, but actually we see that is I've now put in the bottom here these uh, uh, complex transforms that take 60 seconds. And then also you all of a sudden say, you know, let's assume that, oh, there's fresh data, there are new transforms. You have your ad hoc users going at it as well. These are the dark 20 second queries. So now as this adds up, you can actually see here a few things that it goes above the five slot mark. So you have more than five queries running at a time. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 queries at peak, nine, eight here. So what happens now in this situation is that you get queue time. Um, Redshift will not process these queries until a slot is available. And if you add it up, you know, this is 60, 60, this is 180 seconds, uh, 200, 220. So you're getting through to the three minute mark here and all of a sudden a data load that takes five seconds, you know, won't run for another four minutes, five minutes if you add this up. And this is what causes the perception of slow queries, right? When you're running more queries than you have slots available, and you can see this here. So when you drive, when you have a looker dashboard, for instance, and you're waiting for your dashboard to return, you're looking at a spinning wheel. This is part of the reason because you probably do not have your WM configured the right way. Hope that makes sense so far. Now, uh, key concepts here. Number one, we have wasted capacity here, right? So the loads are running, but we have three slots that we're missing here. And then this here we have, we talked about queue wait time, right? So uh, when we talked initially about the default setting, we showed that we can set up different queues. So why not shift these queries into separate queues, increase the slot count, and give them enough space to run? And that's the key of getting high concurrency. And we're gonna talk about right now how we do that, right? So these concepts here are important. Like if you just use the default queue, you will probably end up with periods where you have wasted capacity and you will probably end up with periods where you have excessive queue wait time and all of a sudden everything slows down and you don't know why. Well, this is the reason, this is part of the reason. Okay, so WLM configuration step-by-steps. Steps. These are the four key steps to getting the most out of your cluster resources and achieve high concurrency. Um, we're gonna talk about users, the different types of users in your system, uh, the workloads we have to define, how we group them, and then finally, how we configure the WLM. So let's start with step number one. Um, setting up users, right? Uh, when, you, uh, when you set up a cluster, Redshift comes with a default user. And what we've seen a lot of times is that user gets shared, right? And so um, the dashboards get the same login, you as an ad hoc analyst, like everybody gets sort of the same login. And what that does is you basically have one user logged in that runs SQL and Redshift. And that means you only see the queries, but you do not see who's actually running that query. So you lose visibility, you, you lose granularity. So what we recommend is, um, this is your first step, um, give everybody a login, individual logins, one user, one login. And in this case, one user can be either a person, an analyst on your team, it can be a data load, right? Um, it can be different types of data loads and it can be your dashboards or your machine learning algorithms. Whoever it is, a single user gets a single uh, login. Now, I know there are limits with that, in, in, you know, for instance, if you lose Looker, Periscope Data, or Chartio, they give you one user, okay? And you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes who's running the dashboards. There's a solution for that as well. We're not gonna talk about it today, but feel free to ping me. Um, um, but the key concept is here, no shared logins, right? And if you don't know how to do it, just basically remove all logins from your Redshift cluster, and then people will raise their hand and say, hey, I can't log in anymore, and then give them a new individual login. That's how it's worked best. Now, the next step is to define your workloads. We talked about our three query types, um, loads, transforms, reports, uh, ad hoc queries. <clears throat> so these are your workloads. Jobs that load data into the cluster, the scheduled transformations, and then ad hoc queries by analysts, right? And you have these different users here, one, two, three. Um, and the way you can characterize these, these jobs is the typical SQL commands are copy and unload for your uh, data loads then uh, transforms are typically insert, update, delete. 
And I do hope that you're loading data into Redshift by using the copy command, which is the most efficient way of doing it. Um, and then finally, select statements are typically reused by analysts. You know, this is a good way of categorizing your queries. So once you've done that, you've sort of, you know, you've, you've set up your users, you've categorized them by the type of workload they're running. And, and so now you're in a situation like, okay, I have visibility to my users. I know exactly what type of workloads they're running. Then um, I can now start grouping them, right? So Redshift has this concept of user groups and query groups. So by associating them to a load group, a transform group, and an ad hoc group, I now have everybody um, uh, aligned. And this is important because Redshift prioritizes queries based on on user and query groups, right? So once a query runs, they're gonna check like, okay, does this query belong to a specific group? Yes, oh, okay. Well, what queue is that, uh, what queue is that group of, uh, associated with? So this is why you need to group your users. If you have, this helps you also uh, give access control. If you have very specific queries um, that you wanna, uh, let's say, also protect and shift elsewhere, you, you can do that with query groups, but you know, user groups are the way to go. So now you're in a situation, you've separated your users, you know what workloads they run, and you've grouped them into three different groups. What you can now do is you can go and configure your workload manager. So if you remember, we showed you the screenshot of the workload management console. And what you need to do is now add um, three queues, right? You add uh, one for your ad hocs, one for your transforms, and one for your loads. And you keep the default queue, okay? You keep that one, but uh, let's start there. You change the concurrency, concurrency from five to one, okay? And you give it 1% of memory and you leave it empty. Nobody is allowed to use it, okay? And this is your insurance. If something goes wrong, other than your super user queue, this is a queue you can use to run at least one query and it allows you to get a response, a signal from the cluster. Now, let's talk about these other queues. Create these three different queues, the load queue, the transform queue, and the ad hoc queue. And uh, you assign them a specific concurrency and a specific memory setting. Now, there are other settings in the WM you can do like timeouts and everything. Let's, we'll cover that another time. These are the two most important settings, memory and concurrency. And let me walk you through this a little bit. Uh, number one, loads are typically high frequency but low memory, they have a low memory footprint. Whereas transforms and adult queries typically have a very high memory footprint. Um, but transforms are typically scheduled, they don't run in high frequency, and then adult queries can run a lot. There might be a peak usage, you know, like Monday morning, Tuesday morning. So I've tried to reflect that here. This is a hypothetical setup, so please don't go back and apply this to yours. But um, so uh, let's say a concurrency of 10, and uh, for data loads and 15% of memory, which means they get about 1.5% uh, of query per, uh, of memory per slot. And that's enough for these uh, low memory loads to you know, make sure they don't fall back to this. Next one is once data is in is my transforms, right? Um, I give them four slots, I give them more memory, so they end up with uh, three times as much memory, so they get 4.5. These are big transforms and then finally here, um, ad hoc, you know, I give them lots of concurrency, lots of memory, so they have enough memory per slot to run. And I'm gonna check the questions here real quick if there are any questions. Okay, wait, 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 let's look at jar again. Okay. All right, I'm going to address these after. Um, we end. Okay, so now you have a situation where you have high concurrency, right? Every query can run. I wanted to address this here. Redshift, um, the Redshift docs recommend to not go above 15 uh, in concurrency. And that really, you know, that really is because it's really, really hard to figure out what the right concurrency is. Um, you know, we have a way to figure out how many you really need and how much memory you need to do. And that's, that's the answer, right? You can go up to 50 query slots. That's, that's what Redshift allows you. And if you get the, the memory right and the concurrency right, there's no issue with running 50 slots. We have customers who do that. All right, so now you're, you're, this is your new configuration. You've looked at your workloads and you know exactly how much concurrency and memory they need. And the last step you need to do is apply this new parameter group to your cluster for the changes to take effect. Like, and um, 
let your people know, set a maintenance window, um, change the parameter group to the new one you just created, right? So you, uh, in, in the console, you need to create a new parameter group and apply it, change it. And now next, what you need to do is essentially see what's happening to my wait times. Are my disk space queries going up or down? Hopefully they're not going up and then tweak as needed. And that's pretty much it, right? So now you're off to the races.